In 1034, Michael IV, the Paphlagonian, ascended the throne as a handsome young man who had the potential to resolve the empire's long-standing succession problem. However, his health rapidly declined, and he ended up perishing a bloated shell of himself seven years later at barely over 30 years of age. Michael and his older brother John were far from perfect, but insofar as they offered both reasonably competent administration and a peaceful transition away from the moribund Macedonian dynasty, they had the potential to do a great deal of good for the Byzantine world. However, Michael's premature passing and poor choice of an heir meant that the Paphlagonian dynasty was destined to be stillborn. Here we shall examine the life and times of Michael IV with a focus on several thorny issues, such as how complicit he was in the death of Romanus III, how much he exercised power himself rather than relying upon John the Orphanotrophos, and trying to make sense of the confusing and contradictory accounts that we have of the Bulgarian revolt that Michael faced late in his reign. Unlike the vast majority of the men who would sit upon the imperial throne, Michael did not hail from an aristocratic house. Rather, his origins were quite humble. His family were Greek peasants from Paphlagonia in Asia Minor, who had migrated to Constantinople when he was a small child. His older brother, who seems to have been at least a decade and probably a decade and a half older, John the Orphanotrophos, had become a eunuch and entered into the administration of the empire. He was a capable administrator and he had quickly risen to the office of Perikoimenos under Romanus III Argyrus. John used his access to this elderly emperor to promote his younger brothers. He had four younger brothers, including Michael, and he made sure that all of them were very well provided for. Before he himself came to court, Michael briefly worked as a money changer, and according to more scurrilous accounts of his life, he also engaged in forgery. If we consider that he was only 23 when he ascended the throne, and that he started hanging out at court as Zoe's boyfriend earlier than that, it's very unlikely that he had a lengthy career, much less any kind of criminal career. It's not even likely he would have had the skills to pull off forgery. Zoe, once she met young Michael, was quite dissatisfied with Romanus III, who was not a very good husband. He took other lovers, and although it was highly unlikely that she would get pregnant, they had attempted it, and that attempt had resulted in a predictable failure. So Michael was a much more appealing prospect. He was younger, better looking, and more sweetly tempered. Apparently, Michael also endeared himself to Romanus III as Romanus sometimes called upon Michael to rub his feet as he aged and continued to develop more health issues. By way of recap, Romanus III had died under suspicious circumstances. His health had come and gone, he had suffered from bloating, and he had eventually died after a period of recovery when he had gone swimming in the palace and had an episode and passed away. During this time, Zoe behaved fairly suspiciously, and so it was the common belief that Zoe and Michael had plotted against Romanus, and this was only reinforced by how quickly Zoe remarried to Michael and made sure to legitimate him as quickly as possible. Michael clearly had access to Romanus as he visited Zoe every day, and Romanus was known to speak to him. He even asked Michael from time to time to rub his feet. Most likely, this was Romanus keeping a tab on his wife's lover. He had to be aware of this. And also, as someone who owed his position to his wife, he wasn't in a position to directly deal with Michael. So he had to, I guess, try to make friends with him or neutralize him in some way. But the question becomes, was Michael actually complicit in Romanus' death? Certainly, we know that he was the primary beneficiary, since he becomes emperor, and not just as a consort of Zoe, but in the full sense. Well, the biggest piece of evidence that we have is how he acted afterwards, and it does seem to be something that bothered him for the entirety of his remaining years. 
Early on in his reign, within the first year or so, Michael decided to sideline his wife. And this implies either that he made false promises to a fellow conspirator, that he offered her the world and then took it away, or else that the plot was Zoe's alone and Michael only figured that out later and decided to move against Zoe before she tired of him too. At any rate, what we do know for sure is that even though a lot of people suspected that Michael killed his predecessor, not that many people cared. Romanus had no support among the people or the elite, and no one really was sad to see him go. What mattered is that the Macedonian dynasty, Zoe and her sister, continued, even if both of them were aging and the clock was ticking. Life was still fine, and now there was a handsome young emperor who couldn't really be worse than Romanus in the minds of many people who had tired of Romanus's kind of erratic decision making. So things looked up, but Michael himself always felt some guilt over what had happened to Romanus, and this would haunt him for the rest of his days. One of the biggest controversies about Michael IV, and perhaps the greatest contradiction between our two major sources on his reign, is how active he was or was not in imperial administration. According to John Scalitzes, Michael IV was a total non-entity, and he was merely there as a placeholder while his brother, John the Orphanotrophos, ran the empire. However, according to Michael Pacellus, who is the great biographer of this period, who wrote 14 different biographies of contemporary emperors, Michael IV was actually a very active and conscientious ruler. He was held back by his health and certainly could not work the hours of a Justinian I, but he still did his fair share, if not a little more. By the time he ascended to the throne, it's worth noting that Michael's epilepsy was growing worse, and he was also beginning to show early signs of the disease that would eventually claim his life, dropsy, or to use the more uh, modern parlance, edema. Pacellus also tells us that as his health worsened early in his reign, Michael lost the ability to perform sexually. And he also speculates that part of Michael's loss of sexual desire was guilt over betraying Zoe's trust. That because he had cloistered her early on and not shared power with her as perhaps she had expected, that this caused him to feel more guilt and that made it harder to perform sexually. Michael, due to his very poor health, would spend a lot of the rest of his life in prayer and he seems to have felt that he had sinned in some way or else that he needed to appease God in some manner. So he would mostly live as a pretty celibate emperor even though he came to power quite literally by being a boy toy. One thing that Michael did as emperor, which gained nearly universal respect, at least according to Pacellus, is that because he was able to work through obvious physical pain, especially toward the end as his health worsened and the job got harder, he was able to win a great deal of admiration from his contemporaries who admired his courage. So Michael, was a man who had high character, but he only had the opportunity to exercise that character once he was in the imperial office. Before that, he hadn't really had a chance to show who he was or what he was about. As soon as Romanus was room temperature, the Paphlagonian brothers moved very quickly to secure and legitimate Michael's claim to power. The first and most important step was making sure that Michael and Zoe were married prior to Romanus' funeral. This would head off any potential rivals at the pass. So to secure this, John went to Patriarch Alexius and bribed him. Alexius' asking price was 100 pounds of gold. 50 of those pounds of gold went to the church. The other 50 lined Alexius' pockets. At the funeral, Michael was able to present himself in imperial dignity as the person presiding over the funeral. He looked the part and did a good job. So because people already saw him as emperor, they were more willing to accept his claim. He also, of course, had Zoe by his side, which meant that he had the only real 
claim to the Macedonian dynasty that was available. One of the other early steps the Paphlagonian brothers took to secure power was to neutralize the threat posed by the discontent former ducks of Antioch, Constantine Dalasinos. He had been a potential match for Zoe all the way back in 1028, right before she had married Romanus, but she ultimately had decided to go in a different direction. Constantine was placed under house arrest along with his son-in-law after there were reports of unrest in Antioch, which might point to some kind of uprising on the behalf of Dallasinos. Poor Constantine would spend most of Michael's reign under house arrest. As for Michael himself, he gave out alms, he helped social outcasts, and he built monasteries. This could be a sign of penance, although it is equally plausible that because of his personal suffering, he had a good deal of sympathy for others, and also perhaps he thought that if he showed himself to be a generous steward of the state, that perhaps God would alleviate his own suffering. We'll never know. I would say Michael's complicity in Romanus's murder is a bit of a toss-up, whereas the complicity of John and Zoe is about as obvious as obvious can get. As Anthony Caldellus, one of the leading historians of Byzantium, observes, the way that John and Michael used the mechanisms of power to secure and legitimate their claim was quite brilliant. They used the imperial government to perfection, and this shows that John the Orphanotrophos was a master at using the mechanisms of power to achieve the ends that he wanted. From the very outset of his reign, Michael IV and his brother quietly made moves to make sure that all of the senior commands in the empire were in the hands of men they trusted. This meant reshuffling the deck a bit and also a bit of nepotism. The three other Paphlagonian brothers and their brother-in-law Stephen would all receive high commands. They would, in time, all prove to be not very good at what they did. None of them matched the dedication of Michael IV or the cleverness of John. Each one of them, these other Paphlagonian family members, would all prove to be disappointments. One thing that Michael always ensured is that one of his brothers was always ducks of Antioch at any given time. And this meant that the person who would be most likely to command in an Eastern war where you would need a large army that could potentially be turned against you, that this army would always be in the hands of someone who was a member of the ruling house. The idea here was to always have family members in all of or most of the key commands at every point of the empire that might come into revolt. It was a fairly wise precaution and it would have worked much better had these individuals been more responsible and competent. There were other generals that the Paphlagonians trusted, including Maniakes, who was sent to Vespirican, and Leo Lependrinos, who took command at Edessa. When Michael came to power, the Byzantine world was less than a decade removed from the glory of Basil II and that meant that there were still plenty of veteran formations around and plenty of capable commanders to lead them. Michael knew that if he were to launch a concentrated attack on some enemy somewhere, he'd have a pretty good chance of success. This would also serve to legitimate his reign and sort of legitimate his new dynasty as well. And to that end, Michael looked for an opportunity to succeed. He created this opportunity by first signing a 10-year truce with the Fatimids and then deciding that he was going to follow in the tradition of Basil II by reviving the dormant idea of invading Sicily. In order to secure enough troops for this army, Michael most likely had to strip his armies in the Balkans by either removing a certain number of men from each unit or simply removing whole formations. This in time would prove to have dire consequences. In Sicily itself, Michael had signed a treaty with Ahmad, the Emir of Sicily in 1035, 
but he had an excuse to intervene when Ahmad got involved in a civil war and then the Zirid dynasty of North Africa had intervened. So now he has an excuse to go back on the treaty he had signed. To command this expedition, Michael entrusted the army with George Maniakis, who had recently been in Vespirican. Maniakis was a literal giant. This man was probably over seven feet tall. His height and stature made him rather imposing in the eyes of everyone who met him. He was also militarily accomplished, so he was someone who was a pretty good choice for any command. However, the fleet would be commanded by Michael's brother-in-law, Stephen, who had no meaningful naval experience. Stephen did have experience in the shipbuilding sector, but that's not quite the same thing as leading a fleet in the battle. This pairing would prove to be an unhappy one, but it was not immediately apparent that they would not be able to work together. Michael's plan was for Maniaki's expedition to land in Sicily in 1036, but they actually would not arrive until 1038 due to turmoil in South Italy, where the Byzantines had long had a strong foothold. The talented Basil Boioannis, who had served in the time of Basil II, had done a really good job as Catapano. However, his successors had not been as talented, and because of that, South Italy had experienced a good deal of turmoil in the last several years. Maniakis would have to first deal with that before moving on. Once he got underway, his expedition would contain significant Lombard and Norman contingents. He also would have the Varangian Guard, which at that time included the future King of Norway, Harold Hardrada. So this was a multi-ethnic force, and even for the tall Northmen, who tended to not be impressed by the stature of the Greeks, they found Maniakis to be large and rather intimidating. In 1038, they finally made it to Sicily, and from the outset, the primary problems that they faced were not so much the problems of Muslim resistance as just conflicts among their own personnel and the inability to work together. Early on, it appeared that Maniakis was on the path to conquering Sicily. His first major action upon landing was fought at Rometta, and here Maniakis secured a smashing win over the Zirids. This cleared out any challenge from a Zirid field army and meant that for the next two years, Maniakis was able to focus on gaining control of major urban centers, such as Messina, Palermo, and Syracuse. It was only in 1040 when the Zirids would have a large enough army to fight Maniakis in the open again. This would result in the Battle of Troina, west of Mount Etna. And at this battle, the Byzantines once again won overwhelmingly. Abd Allah's army was so badly smashed that he was forced to run for his ships. And had the Byzantines pursued a bit more vigorously, perhaps this would have been the end of Zirid efforts to save Sicily for the forces of Islam. George Maniakis was a talented commander, but he was a man who still had his faults. One of his biggest faults is that he had a volcanic temper. And he also seems to have been rather insensitive to the politics of the imperial court. When Stephen failed to prevent the Zirid retreat after Troina, Maniakis was infuriated. So rather than waiting to calm down to confront his admiral, he instead immediately grabbed him, hit him on the head with a whip, and then said that the only reason that Stephen was an admiral is because he had performed sexual favors on the emperor. Now, it would have been bad enough to simply accuse the emperor of nepotism, but to assume that the two men were engaged in a homosexual relationship, that was a bridge too far. This was an insult that neither Stephen nor the emperor was willing to tolerate. Maniakis did not limit his insults to his fellow Byzantine commanders, however, as around this same time, he also badly insulted Arduin, the leader of the Lombards, 
to the point that Ardwin decided to withdraw his contingent altogether back to Italy and soon thereafter revolted. When Michael IV learned of Maniaki's behavior, he had him fired and arrested. It's no surprise that he did so. However, this would then lead to the expedition falling into the hands of less capable commanders and also due to the departure of the Lombards being quite a bit weaker than it had been. A worse army under a worse commander, what could go wrong? I can only imagine that George Maniakis did not react well to being arrested. I would love to know how he reacted to the news that the new commander would be none other than Stephen. In Pacellus's words, and this man had a gift for a turn of phrase, he said that Stephen's attempt at command was like a pygmy playing Hercules. Needless to say, Stephen's command was not long and he did not do well. I believe he died around this time and then was replaced by Basil Pediadides, a eunuch. Pediadides was not able to hold on to any of Maniaki's gains except for Messina, but even that city in the northeast of Sicily would fall in 1042. Neither Stephen nor Pediadides were military geniuses, that much is obvious. However, I see no reason to believe that either of them was a Luigi Cadorna come early. A lot of their failure was due to the context rather than their individual abilities. There was a heavy reallocation of resources to Italy proper in the West because of that Lombard revolt I alluded to earlier. So not only did one contingent go home and revolt, but then other contingents had to go after them to deal with them. And reinforcements that might have come to Sicily were stuck in Italy. At the same time, more resources from the Balkans were not forthcoming because there was the biggest event of Michael IV's reign, the Bulgarian Revolt, that occurred throughout the Balkans. So effectively, Stephen and Pediadides were playing with very much a drastically reduced army and doing so at a time when clearly they were no longer the empire's number one priority. So we should cut them a little bit of slack. A pygmy playing Hercules, while it's a funny phrase, is perhaps excessively harsh. Although the attempt to expand Byzantine power in the Sicily would fail completely, the Byzantines were luckier when it came to holding the line in Italy itself. The Lombards, who had been alienated by Maniaches, proved to be a serious threat, and yet they were in fact contained. The Lombards launched a revolt in Apulia in 1040, and before they launched their revolt, they managed to achieve the assassination of the reigning Catapano, so the Byzantines were without a designated head in Italy. Despite this disadvantage, and despite being distracted with problems elsewhere, the Byzantines were still able to contain the Lombards, but only by depriving Stephen and Pediadides of the forces that they needed to be successful in Sicily. So, again, most of the failure in Sicily was due to the need to preserve Italy. Italy was more important, so the Byzantines made the right decision, but still it is disappointing that after all the effort that they went through to make gains in Sicily, all those gains had to be abandoned to deal with ultimately a personality dispute between Maniaches and a Lombard leader. Back in the Balkans at this time, the greatest crisis of Michael IV's reign was brewing. Here, one of the many Bulgarian officers who were now senior members of the Byzantine army, Peter Delgin, revolted. He claimed to be a bastard grandson of Tsar Samuel, and so he wanted to succeed him in that office. His primary partner in crime was his cousin, Eleusian. By the time that Delgin and Eleusian revolted, the Bulgarians had been integrated into the Byzantine army for about 20 years. This seems to have come out of the blue and taken the entire administration by surprise. As for Lucian's motives, he seems to have been further motivated by the fact that he had been an officer serving in the East 
and he had been sacked and placed under house arrest by John after a failure perceived or real. However, modern historians think that the motives might have been a bit different. Romilly Jenkins, for instance, believes that John's fiscal policies had angered the Bulgarian elite as he tried to make them switch from payment of tax in kind to payment in coin. And we also know that one motive for the Bulgarians might have been Bulgarian nationalism. Later, Bulgarian historians would call this whole period the Greek slavery. Whatever the reasons, though, Delgin's revolt would be a serious challenge and would require Michael to make unprecedented efforts on behalf of the empire. Neither Skylitsis nor Pacellus has an entirely coherent account of the revolt of Delgin. And so I'd like to try to take stock and present a rational interpretation of what might have happened. So we know that the Bulgarians were integrated into the Byzantine army as a whole, and that due to security concerns, they were not concentrated in any one place. This meant, however, that there were Bulgarians in positions of power throughout the empire and Bulgarians in garrisons all over. This also meant that many of the Bulgarian cities were in fact garrisoned by non-Bulgarians who would not join in. So I think it goes without saying that any kind of idea that all of Bulgaria rose up has to go out the window. And this will also account for how quickly the revolt will fizzle out once the leaders are dealt with. We also know that one of the prongs of the Bulgarian conspiracy was in Antioch. But here, Michael IV's brother Constantine, who was pretty much useless most of the time, finally came in handy by detecting the conspiracy and getting rid of the ringleaders by blinding them. There was also a plot in Constantinople which centered around the future patriarch Michael Carularius, but a series of preventative arrests managed to deal with that issue. At the time when this conspiracy broke out into revolt, the emperor himself was actually not in Constantinople, but rather in Thessalonica, visiting a monastery or something of that nature. And then news arrived that Eleusian had escaped house arrest and led a large body of men over to his cousin. So now the crisis was officially on. It would probably take a while for Michael IV to really get accurate information on exactly what was going on, but this seems to have been it. There was an attempt to seize power in multiple places, but it only really took effect in the Balkans. And even then, probably not in that many places. The Bulgarian Revolt of 1040 would lead to Michael IV's most iconic decision. By this point in his life, Michael IV was pretty limited in terms of his mobility. His legs had swollen badly, and so it was difficult for him to walk or ride a horse. Nonetheless, despite his pain and mobility issues, Michael was determined to lead the army in person to crush the revolt before it got any worse. So against the advice of everyone around him, he led out the army in person for probably the first time in his life and boldly fought through the pain in order to try to head off this revolt before it got too serious. Our sources, at least Pacellus, tell us that Michael was motivated primarily by shame. He was embarrassed by the fact that his Sicilian expedition had failed and that he had not been able to add anything to the empire. However, he said that as emperor, he would make sure that he would at least preserve everything that he had inherited, even if he was not going to be able to expand the realm. So Michael takes the field and he is grimly determined to crush the revolt, even if this means making exertions which will cost him his life a few years early. Twice before this point in the video, I have mentioned that all of our accounts of the uprising of Peter Delgin are not very coherent or cohesive. We don't have anything like a clear picture of how this campaign was conducted. 
and neither Skylitzes nor Pacellus were particularly all that great at describing military affairs in general. Nonetheless, despite the muddled nature of their testimony, I've tried to combine what they said and also make some reasonable suppositions to come up with a somewhat plausible construction of what might have happened. If you're wondering where I got this, this is something that I invented for myself. This is why this video took so long, because I had to figure out what might have happened that actually makes sense and does not directly contradict what we know to be true. So bear with me as I try to make sense of a confusing campaign. During the first battle of Thessalonica, Delgin marched on Michael. He defeated him in the field and trapped the Byzantine army at Thessalonica. This occurred in 1040. After this initial victory, Delgin then leaves Eleusian in charge of the siege at Thessalonica and with a flying column marches all the way west to Dyrrhachium on the west coast of the Balkans. He captures this port and then he goes back through Bulgaria looking for any garrisons that are willing to revolt or to help out any places that might need his aid. Michael made a big error during this campaign by issuing orders, including sacking the general at Dyrrhachium, which proved to be very unpopular with the men. Perhaps Michael didn't trust the general, but the men did. And after their general was fired, the men under this general then defected to the Bulgarians and that led to the fall of Dyrrhachium. However, while things were going badly for Michael, Eleusian would prove to be a useful enemy. As he decided to launch an ill-advised attack on Thessalonica to try to end the war early. And because of Thessalonica's fortifications, this attack failed horribly and Eleusian lost 15,000 of his 40,000 man army. This now meant that Michael IV was able to freely move about and that he had regained, if not quite the initiative, then at least some freedom of movement. Now that he could escape Thessalonica, Michael marched northeast to Mosinopolis, which is sort of halfway between Thessalonica and Constantinople and is on the border between Byzantine Thrace and what had once been the Bulgarian Empire. Here he was reinforced from Constantinople, and now his army total was around 40,000 men. So he'd take up position at Mosinopolis and await the arrival of the Bulgarians. Most likely, Delgin and Eleusian were forced to go confront the emperor because they were looking for a decisive win that would then force more of the garrisons in Bulgaria to hand over their cities. Again, I'm assuming, based on the speed of the campaign after Mosinopolis, that in fact most of the cities in Bulgaria did not get turned over to the Bulgarians. So Delgin and Eleusian know that they need a decisive victory in order to make this project stick. However, dissension between them, possibly over Eleusian's defeat at the Second Battle of Thessalonica, meant that one of the men seized the other and blinded him. I believe that of the two accounts, each one has it the opposite way. Here I'm just going to say that Delgin blinded Eleusian because he was the more prestigious and powerful of the two. At any rate, this dissension helped to further demoralize the Bulgarians, and if I'm right that most of the cities had not fallen to the Bulgarians, then their logistics might have been a bit of a mess. In the battle, Michael was able to win overwhelmingly and then mount a pursuit of the Bulgarians all the way through their former territory, marching pretty rapidly from Sertica to Prelep. Delgin was captured probably not long after Mosinopolis itself, and with Delgin in hand, Michael then marched through the rest of Bulgaria and reduced the garrisons that had revolted. The last holdout was at Prelep, which fell in 1041. Overall, the revolt lasted perhaps a year, probably a couple months shy of that. And again, I don't believe that it spread to most of the garrisons, otherwise this process would have taken a good deal longer. In late 1041, Michael returned to Constantinople and celebrated the triumph. Most likely, he used Delgin as a footstool while he watched races, and then had the Bulgarian pretender put to death. 
However, while such an event would be the highlight of most emperors' lives, for Michael it's very unlikely that he enjoyed any of this. By this point, his health was absolutely rotten. It had gotten much, much worse after all the exertions of this recent campaign. And so, most of the time, Michael was bedridden. And it was clear to even his most optimistic followers that his condition was worsening rapidly. Zoe requested a final visit, knowing that Michael didn't have much more time, but Michael declined his wife's request, possibly either because he didn't want her to see him like this and remember him that way, or else because he had guilt over sidelining her several years earlier. At any rate, the Imperial couple probably never saw each other in person for about the last six years or so of their marriage. I suppose for anyone in a bad marriage, that was probably about the goal. But it doesn't seem like Michael bore any ill will against Zoe, merely that he either didn't trust her or felt that he had betrayed her and therefore could not face her. Not long after he denied Zoe's request for a last visit, Michael passed away in 1041, around the age of 30 or 31. At the end of the day, Michael IV and his brothers, despite their corruption and shortcomings, worked well together as a team to manage the empire. Sure, they were far from perfect. John the Orphanotrophos was a somewhat harsh taskmaster, and he was not beloved, and the other brothers had problems with maturity. Yet, they managed to come through often enough to keep things together. Michael also, it is worth noting, really should not have done as well as he did. He was completely inexperienced when he came to power. He had no legitimate training to be a ruler or a commander. And his health was absolutely abysmal and only got worse over the course of his relatively short reign. Yet, despite that, Michael was mostly competent and successful. However, I cannot consider him a great emperor or even a good one because at the end of the day, all of his accomplishments amount to nothing more than damage control. He tried to mount an expedition to Sicily, but the arrogance of his commander caused that to unravel. And while he did competently deal with the Bulgarian crisis, at the end of the day, that is really all he did was to prolong the Macedonian twilight. While he did have the potential to allow for a peaceful transition away from the Macedonians as he continued to win acclaim and admiration, his short life meant that ultimately, much like Romanus III, he was more or less just a placeholder. He was an extension of a dying dynasty with two aging heiresses. The clock was ticking and Michael IV served his role pretty well. He was a better caretaker than Romanus III for certain, but at the end of the day, he ultimately resolved nothing essential. So Michael IV, while he was a memorable emperor, was actually a very average emperor 